Father, thank you for going before us and giving us the use of the faculty of our being. And with every fiber of our being, we worship you. And we pray that you would be magnified and lifted up in this place, that the body of Christ might be edified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Vivian. That was beautiful. Beautiful to have this. Good morning, everyone. How are you all on this bright, sunny day? I have to tell you, it's a delight to be up here to be able to welcome you today because in six days, I will be flying to Oklahoma to begin a new chapter in life. Oklahoma. I'm leaving California to go to Oklahoma. But you know, Oklahoma has one wonderful asset. My son lives right in the middle of the state. Amen. And so that is a draw for, for, for me and for them. We're really looking forward to beginning a new chapter together that we're living close to one another. Um, I haven't done that since he was a junior in high school. So uh, it's been a long time. And uh, we meet, but not in a daily way. So God is good. You know, I hit a new decade and the chapter turned and, and here I am, off on a new adventure. So, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Um, is that the right time? Am I doing the announcements? Yet? Uh, okay, wait a minute, sorry. Yes, the announcements, good. I'm going to turn to the back of your page. I'll ask you to join me. I'm starting from the bottom because we have something different here. The name badges is an announcement I want to make and we are asking you if you have requested a badge 
to return to the table in the foyer and add your backing preference. Evidently, they have some choices. Uh, probably a pen, something sticky. I'm not quite sure what it is. But, but a new fo uh, back to, to stick it on you. And they want to put on your telephone number, or at least have it. I'm not sure which way that goes. But they want you to add the preference for the backing and a phone number. Second thing coming up the list is the Women's Fellowship is meeting on uh, Tuesday at 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the Krabari Conference Room. And bring an appetizer or finger food or something that you would like to share with other people. And then next Sunday, the 28th, we're going to present the scholarship for, from the Chapel Music uh, Society, no, really from the choir, the Chapel Music Scholarship that we've collected uh, donations for. Um, and the recipients are Kaylin Elliser and Nina Bingo. Vecco, okay, Vecco. And they're going to sing and play. It's going to be a great uh, music Sunday. So we invite, uh, ask you to invite your friends and family or neighbors or people that you know would really enjoy this special music. And next Sunday also, uh, Eric Unruh, Peter Unruh's and, uh, son, is going to speak um, about one of the missions, Chi Alpha, under the Assemblies of God. And we'll, we'll talk to us next Sunday. So we have a lot going on next Sunday. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Is that it? Do we want to sing now? What? The new officers. Thank you, sir. I didn't see this. Sorry. Um, because I'm leaving, <laughs> Brooks, I want to thank you very much for accepting the challenge of taking my place on the board. Um, and... Walter Havicek has also taken the place of Nick. Um, Walter's a wonderful treasurer, and uh, we thank him for his time and service. Okay, now we can sing. Um, the Eternal Father, strong to say? Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Uh, I said I'd be very calm up here. Okay, surely the presence is here in the way. Yeah. Yes, I will. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Would you bow your head for a moment of silent prayer? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we, miss, we thank you for all the many, many blessings we have, and I thank you particularly for this wonderful church family that you guided me to. We ask that you continue to watch out 
for all of us here and help us with all of these little crossroads in life. Amen. Well, I love the term church family because in moving out here 26 years ago, I looked and looked and looked for a church that would kind of fit my requirements, but I really wasn't sure what my requirements were. And when I walked in to this chapel, uh, the perfect chapel full of imperfect people, I knew that I had found the place. I'm, I love working with people and getting to know them. And here was a chapel that I could walk in and enjoy the service without feeling like I'd just gone to a movie. You know, you go in, you come out, and that's the end of it. I wanted to come in and get to know the people I was sitting next to and praying with and praying for. I wanted to get in and serve, serve the Lord in my own tiny little way. And this chapel gives you an opportunity to do that. Um, it was, it's been a blessing to be here for at least, at least 20 years. I can't quite count. And I hope that you have felt that welcomingness for all of these years that you have been here. Um, I've really, really, truly enjoyed getting to know so many people and singing with them and, and um, uh, learning more about their lives and helping out. Um, oh, let's see. There's... I'm so sorry. I am rattled today. I can see this. But yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay. Okay. I think I did everything. Are we done? I think so. we're going to call it done. Okay. Shall, shall we go on to uh, whatever is next? Help me out here. You know. <laughs> uh, sorry. When you get in trouble, ask for help. You know, that's my motto. Ooh. This is Eternal Father's strong <laughs> Jesus.
morning. Is it a good morning? Yes. That's all it is, is just a good morning? It's a great morning. We're all in our places. <laughs> With sunshiny faces. Praise God for your presence today, and I am so delighted that we are together again. Uh, we've been apart for a week or some 
of you have been par apart for a couple of weeks. I see the new lo loving uh, lovebirds in the back there <laughs> that joined us today. And uh, let's go before God together. Father God, we are so grateful that you have loved us with a love that we continually try to comprehend the depth of it. But Lord, there is no end to your love for us. And Father, we thank you that we can find comfort in this place, that your name is hallowed, and your presence is inviting us to come closer to you. And Father, we pray that you will speak in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that you have provided for us that life doesn't end at death. Life begins again in your eternal presence for those of us who believe in your Son. Father, we ask your blessings on each person. And Lord, as you've taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We bless those, Lord, who are in the stages of grief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join us as we sing together, God will take care of you. We try to introduce new hymns sometimes. I understand that this particular hymn is one that maybe some of us aren't super familiar with. So I'm going to have this hymn start. Dan Parker's going to play through the whole thing for us, and then we'll sing again. <laughs> Yeah. 
Let us stand for the doxology. Father God, as we bring our tithes and offerings, we pray that you will bless them and may they be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, bless those who have given out of their abundance and those who have given out of their need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Give Vivian a hand, our harpist this morning. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we pray for Martha Telecki this morning. Uh, this is her Sunday, so do remember her in your prayers. But uh, I've got to make a commercial announcement here. Would you like to meet me up here? Oh 
Many of you know how blessed we are and how blessed this community has been because of Reen. She is an artist. Uh, she is a person that loves people. And um, she's very charismatic. <laughs> and uh, we're going to miss her a lot. And um, we just thought that, you know, as she remembers us, she will remember that she has our hearts. And we have her heart on behalf of the chapel and the community at large, we present to you, my dearest sister, our heartfelt thanksgiving for all of the gifts that God has given you to share with the community. Our prayers go with you. Father God, we pray your blessings on Reen. And Lord, we know that you order her steps because she is a good woman. And Father, we thank you that you are her protector and provider and her strong tower. We pray for her health and strength. Thank you, Lord, for her joy that is unspeakable and full of your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray that you give her traveling mercies and may her celebration of her son and all that that involves be just ongoing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We bless you. you. Receive our heart. <laughs> we give you thanks. I'm so sorry I messed this up. I'm more excited than I thought or flustered or yeah, whatever. But I do love it here and I so love knowing all of you. Thank you. Will somebody follow me home? I have no idea. <laughs> well, we just want to make sure that we are living up to our reputation, that uh, this is the perfect church for imperfect people, and we want to make sure we're measuring up every Sunday so nobody is caught off guard because we've done things perfectly but we have not. We serve a perfect God. I am so delighted this morning that you have chosen to join us in celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I would have it no other way to live my life than to live my life with eternity in view. I know where I'm going. I know what has been promised to me. And I am so grateful that God gives us time to prepare. Hello. As you take time to prepare for your trips and uh, you get all things organized so that everything is prepared and you don't have a worry, you're not frustrated because your luggage is packed, and you're leaving in a great time to get to the airport, and all the systems are down. Well, it's just a precursor of things that are going to be happening in greater ways as we come to the end of time that we know it here on planet Earth. We know that Christ's return is imminent. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where love is. Everybody is looking for love. They're looking to be loved. They're looking to be accepted. They're looking to be on occasions when they mess up to be forgiven. I want to start with you today with the application because I'm going to be going through this series of where love is using 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is a very familiar passage of Scripture, particularly when people are getting married. Hello. 
when they're getting married, the, the minister or the pastor always refers to this particular chapter of 1 Corinthians. I want to give you the application. Our most profound quest in life as human beings is to be what? Loved. We want to be loved. We want to be loved. We want to be affirmed by others. And uh, I want to talk to you about that this morning. Finding and maintaining love is our greatest challenge in life. Hello, people are still looking for it. After 10 marriages, they're still looking for it. Hello. People have not come to the realization where love is. And I want to share my heart with you this morning as we go through this series of where love is. Our scripture text is found in 1 first, in, in, uh, first Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. And you have noticed on verse 4, I did not finish the entire verse because I want to deal with each of the items in that particular passage of scripture. In your hearing, I, if I speak with, in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not found, but have not loved, I am sounding, I am noise, I'm a, I'm a noisy gong or, or a clinging cymbal. If I have the prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as for to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. And I pause right here um, because I want to deal with the, um, with the entire scripture, but I felt that we've got 20 minutes, so uh, we're going to get this done. Amen? Amen? We can enjoy all the other biblical forms of love, such as uh, philia, 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 brotherly love, uh, aro, aros, which is the sexual love, um, uh, stor storge, which is the family, but my focus this morning is on agape. All of those other characteristics of love are important, but not as important as agape. Agape, love, satisfies the soul. And a lot of times people will neglect their soul in search of satisfying those other forms of love. But the greatest love that we could possess is agape. 1 John 4, 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. For God is love. And if you want to stay in love, you have to stay connected to the source. Hello. If you want to stay in love with your mate, you have to stay connected to the source. God is love. The more we love God, the more we're capable of loving one another. Because all of us are broken people. We didn't go into marriage with perfection. Hello. We went into marriage with brokenness. Will you accept my brokenness is what you're really saying to the person that you're marrying, that you're accepting me with all my faults, with all of my, incons with all of my in inconsistencies, with all of my inabilities. Do you accept me? And love Agape love helps us to do that. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In God, we see 
what the true love looks like. What does love look like? Love looks exactly like Jesus Christ. John 3.16 was the foundation that I shared with you last Sunday. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever, wherever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he that has the son has what? Has eternal life. You have come into relationship with Jesus Christ. You have eternal life. You live on. In God is Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us. When did he do that? When did God demonstrate his love toward us? While we were still in rebellion against God, while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for us because he wants a what? Relationship with us. He gave us free will, thinking that we would be smart and intelligent and know where love is and remained in love. But the enemy says, well, you know, here's something a little better for you. Here's something that God says not to do, but I'm going to make a difference and show you that you could be just like God, knowing good and evil. Did he not say that God told Adam and Eve not to tr touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil? He says, when you do that, you're going to die. They didn't fall dead, but the relationship that they had with God, the intimate relationship that they had with God, they lost. They were disconnected. How do you feel when all of your power goes out? Hello. When the power in your house goes out. Are you happy? No, you're sad. You're miserable because you're thinking about, oh, I just bought a turkey or something in the freezer and the power's out. See, God does not want us disconnected, but he wants us connected to the source of fulfillment. We are totally fulfilled with agape love, with God's love. He fulfills us. And we do not have to wonder where love is or where love comes from. God is love. And I tell young couples that I've counseled, I say, the more you love God, the more you're capable of loving your mate. The less you love God, the less you're capable of covering your mate. Because the Bible says love covers what? A multitude, and I've got a multitude of faults, but I'm covered. Praise the Lord, somebody. You can drop your H-bomb here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love covers us, and we are to cover one another with the love that we have been given, and that love has come from Jesus Christ. And he has told us to do an impossible task. Did he not say, love your enemies? Oh, Lord, help me. I can't stand that man. I can't stand that woman. When have you heard that? Is it an echo? <laughs> But the love that God gives us is a love that covers. And we can even love our enemies. This verse reminds us, verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have no love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. This verse reminds us that love is not 
about what we can gain, but what we can give. Before accepting Jesus Christ, all the Corinthians were deeply associated with pagan temple worship of idols. They participated in heathen feasts to celebrate their idols. After their conversion, some continued participating in those customs and temple worship. You know, America does a lot of temple worship. Stadiums, auditoriums, their singers come in and perform the Super Bowl. They perform and the people's idols come in. And what do people do? They worship. Ah, hello. They worship. They adore them. We still practice those old forms of temple worship. Paul addresses the believers in Corinth about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the gifts given to build and edify the church. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 and 8 says, but, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. God has given to the members of the body of Christ gifts from the Holy Spirit for the edification, the building up of faith in the body of Christ. And some people sit on their gifts. Some people refuse to use their gifts. Some people don't want others to know that they have been gifted in certain areas of life. And we represent the body of Christ. We thrive on those gifts being used, those gifts being utilized. So Jesus left men gifts. These gifts of the Holy Spirit were con will continue, and they were supposed to continue until the Lord returns to receive his bride. Every single gift that God has given has not been stripped away, has never been taken away. Why would you give a gift and take it away? Hello, somebody. Would you give a person a gift and say, oh, I'm sorry I gave you that gift. I, I'm, I, was, I don't know what I was thinking about, but please can I have it back? That would be absurd. You'd get mad, wouldn't you? You'd get angry. You receive the gift and says, oh, boy, this is so precious. Thank you. Thank you very much for thinking about me. And then all of a sudden, the person comes back and says, well, I'm sorry I gave you this gift. It wasn't for you. You would no longer want to have fellowship with the person. <laughs> but God is not that way. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are to continue. The gifts include the word of wisdom and of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. Yes, God gave these gifts for the building of his kingdom. These gifts were likely to, on display in Corinth. Paul emphasizes that the Spirit decides who to give each gift to. Some people emphasize the lesser gifts than the greater gifts. And they magnify the lesser gifts of speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues as something great when they're least. These gifts were to be used for expanding the kingdom of God. Paul emphasized, emphasizes that the Spirit decides. Some people were ignorant of how God had given men these gifts, these supernatural abilities, 
to advance the work of Jesus Christ on the earth. Through the preaching, God bears witness to Paul's ministry with signs of healing and deliverance. These signs shall follow those who believe in the book of Mark. As some men have, Paul does not exalt the gifts over the gift giver. He doesn't exalt the gifts over the giver of gifts. No matter how eloquent, articulate, knowledgeable, commanding, or fluent in the gifts of tongues, without love, it's empty noise. And sometimes people are speaking and all of a sudden they speak in another language. And, well, where, what, what is he saying? What, what did he mean by that? What, what's going on? And sometimes people use the gift of tongues to elevate themselves as if they're so super spiritual. You can drop an H-bomb in here. What I'm speaking is truth anyway. And through the preaching, God affirmed Paul's message. The understanding is crucial in our spiritual journey of understanding the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given for the church. Verse 2, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as so to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Paul elevates a person's ability to demonstrate how worthless spiritual gifts are when attempted without love for others. The Corinthians highly valued these gifts and elevated those among them with the gifts of tongues and prophesy and prophecy. Even today, some people value others with those gifts as being the most spiritual. Paul has declared that this is not true. All the gifts are needed in the church. If we speak in a foreign language, is there anyone that understood what he said or what she said? Because we're not being edified. We're not being edified by that. So we need to be edified by whatever language the person is speaking so that we can understand what God is saying through the individual. Hello, somebody. A person with all the prophetic insights and revelation of God's mysteries, abilities are worthless without love. He says, possessing all the faith to muster the ability to remove mountains that may confront our life would be misplaced and meaningless without love. Without the love of God. Others may consider it a powerful, consider you a powerful individual because you speak in tongues, but in God's view, your abilities are nothing. Verse 3, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. The Corinthians thought that some were, were more spiritual than others and some were less spiritual because they had less prestigious gifts. The gifts were desired because of the notoriety that could be gained. Well, I speak in different languages. Well, so? Okay. If God is not being glorified, if people are not who are members of the body of Christ, it means absolutely nothing. You are just edifying yourself. 
Jesus told a rich young man, a rich young ruler, to sell all that he gave, all that he had, and give the money to the poor. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 23 through 20 through 22 says, Now as he was going out on the road, one came returning, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do you commit adultery? Do you do not murder? Do not steal? Do not bear false witness? Do not defraud? Honor your mother and your father. And it says... Um, do not commit adultery. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And it reminded me of the time, and, and Jesus said, verse 21, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. See, it reminds me of sometimes, you know, a person says, well, all my life I have lived this life as a Christian. But there's one thing that you may lack. Jesus did not fault him for doing the commandments and obeying obedient to the commandments. He confronted him with the thing that he just was possessed with. Hello. Are you riding this road with me this morning? The one thing that had his heart. And what was that? His riches. And so we can do all that we can to live according to the word of God, but who has your heart? And Jesus went right to the heart and says, well, you know, that's fine and dandy. You're looking good, young man. I'm proud of you, young man. But there's one thing that you lack. Just one thing. Give all that stuff that you've collected, all that stuff that has had your heart, Give it away and follow me. And he couldn't release that. He couldn't let that go. Verse 4, praise God, somebody. If, we could, if he could have accomplished those instructions, he would have reached the height of his spiritual relationship with Christ. Yet Paul insists that Doing so without love for others gives the giver nothing. If he gave it away and didn't have love, none of this, even allowing your body to be burned for a worthy cause, gains nothing without love. If he could have achieved that, if he could have released that, he would have come into an intimate relationship with God through Christ. Verse 4 in closing, love is patient. Look around this room. God's patience. God's patience. God's patience. God's patience. Waiting for us to come into an intimate relationship with him. He waits for years upon years. His love has never failed any one of us. He has loved us regardless of our willfulness, regardless of our stubbornness he has loved us waiting till the moment that we say Lord I 
surrender all. Everything that I am, everything that I would be, everything that I have, Lord, I surrender to you. There was no break in their daily communion with God. Adam and Eve, when they were connected, they were holy unto the Lord until the enemy came in and said, well, you, I think you need something more. They needed nothing. And the devil will always tempt you into saying you need more. You need something else. God's love is perfect. Lucifer, the fallen angel, was the only living creature with the spirit of cruelty, envy, arrogance, and boasting of his worth when he turned from God. Be careful of your boasting. Be careful of those who boast, who are filled with pride. The Bible says pride leads to destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Love is humble. Love is gentle. Love is kind. The kind of leadership that we're looking for are people who love people who love God and who love people. You can't separate the two. You can't say, well, I love people, but I don't love God. Or I love God, but I despise people. No, that doesn't mix. So Lucifer fell, and he was subtle, and convinced them to believe that they were incomplete and needed more than what God had already provided for their eternal welfare. My security is not in the government. My security is not in who's going to be the president and who's in the cabinet. My security is in Jesus Christ. That's the one I'm waiting for. Hello. That's the one I'm looking to. That's the one I'm preparing my soul for. People are caught up with the fantasy that somehow the world is going to get better. Well, you haven't read Revelations. Because according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ's return is imminent. Any moment he can come. Are you ready? None of us can deny that God hasn't been patient and kind with us in our sins, which are against his will for our lives. His love in our hearts does not cause us to envy our gifts, but enables us to build each other up in glorifying Father God. We live to glorify God. If you're wondering what you're living for, it is to glorify God to honor God, to bring praise to God because he purchased your life, your soul. We are humble and honored to serve God and others by the power of the Holy Spirit as we deny self-importance. None of us are as important as the love that God has given to us. Let us pray. Father God, we are so grateful for your love for us. We're so grateful that you forgive us when we confess our sins. You are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, let your love be the motivation for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand to be dismissed. Join us as we sing our benediction. May the peace of God be upon you, and may the Holy Spirit lead and guide you, and may you be used for the furtherance of his kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.